Hello, and welcome to Ask John. This is a show that was conceived with the idea that people would come on and ask John, I'm John Reicher, by the way, uh, to come on and ask John financial questions. And uh, that's kind of how the first couple of ep episodes went. And it turned out that I enjoyed, uh, I enjoyed asking the questions. And I found some really interesting guests. And, um, and I started asking them questions. So it's not so much a financial show as it used to be, but you're certainly welcome to call me anytime and ask me any kind of financial question or any kind of question you want to. Uh, today I have another interesting guest, and uh, so this is going to be um, another exception to the rule that, uh, that um, I'm going to be asking the questions. My guest today is Leonard Rubio, and uh, Leonard has uh, some very interesting things to tell us. Uh, Leonard is the executive director of the Insight Prison Project, IPP, which is a nonprofit organization in San Rafael. Uh, it works with the San Rafael, uh, I'm sorry, it works with the California prison system. And uh, well, we're going to hear a little bit uh, from Leonard. Uh, Leonard, how, how would you like to introduce yourself? Oh, uh, so. I've got a long history with the Insight Prison Project. I actually started as one of the participants in the programs that they offered at San Quentin. Um, I was incarcerated for 23 and a half years for second degree murder oh. that I committed back in 1986. Um, was sentenced to 15 years to life. And as I said, I spent 23 and a half years in prison uh, preparing myself for when I would finally be released and the programs within Insight Prison Project are a big part of what helped me get ready. And I'm continuing to do the programs because of not only the transformation I've seen in my life, but the transformation I've seen in many, many other men's lives as well. So, so um, was this idea conceived while you were serving time, while you were in prison, or just something that you, you and is this basically your idea? How, how, Not my idea. No? Okay. Um, it's something you certainly grabbed onto. Definitely something I grabbed onto. At 18 years old, I, I killed my girlfriend here in the Bay Area on a high school campus. And as a result of that, there were a lot of people impacted. Obviously, her life being taken, um, her family, her friends, the community but also my family and my friends. And for me, I was incarcerated as punishment, but the punishment as far as incarceration for me wasn't a huge deal because of the pain that I've got to live with every day, having taken another person's life. The, the, the prison um, is, uh, is more, more in your mind and in your heart than, than definitely. In, inside the walls. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. Um, before we go on, I think uh, to introduce the program, let's play uh, a, a short clip. This is something that's, that's on your website. And I understand this is something that is being, uh, uh, per, this is a, a, what, a trailer for an actual uh, film that you're, you're preparing. So um, let, let's play that. And okay. That'll give our audience kind of an idea of what we're talking about, and then you can get into more detail. Let's... He, in cold blood, gunned down my husband, and then stood over him and kept shooting. I did come to prison because I did something terrible. I, I, I killed somebody. I am only and just a murderer. I was an instrument of destruction. I am a conservative hardliner, very much in favor of the death penalty. There's just no redemption. Prison supports segregation. You're a Mexican, so you're either Southern or Northern, or you're a Paisa. That just fueled the anger and the violence that was in me already. And that's the problem. Everybody following all this prison stuff, but ain't nobody showed me how to get out of prison. Well, I'm gonna just continue on being who I am. And I got the death penalty. I got what I wanted. Nothing changed. I didn't feel better. It didn't work. Coming to San Quentin, though, is actually what put everything in perspective. It's really about being on a journey together to connect the dots of their lives that led to a crime. To walk deeply and profoundly in accountability. I'm sorry for taking your son. 
had no right. I was just so bitter with hate. That had to change. I had no idea that I would find my healing inside of a prison. When somebody, a stranger, murders your loved one, I would have nightmares that, well, I'm next, and my kids are next. And the way that you allow survivors to come in and say what we need to say, I can't even begin to quantify how healing that has been for me. It's how this system should work. Do you want him to remain on death row? No, not at all. Yeah. Not at all. Hurt people hurt people, and we've been hurting each other forever. The programs that I learn in here, I sit with my kids in the visiting room, and I teach them it. It's time for change. Wow. Uh, so these, these are not actors. No, they're not actors. That clip, as you shared, is part of a documentary called The Prison Within, that they're in the final editing stages and should be coming out later this year. It is six years in the making. And they went into San Quentin and filmed our victim offender education group with the participants that are part of the group. So you're talking about victim offender education, education group. group. So this is something that's going on in the prison and uh, the prisoners are volunteering for this because they, yes. they're looking for the healing that it brings them. Or why, 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 are they, why do they get into it? A lot of people are looking to understand what brought them to the point they were willing to commit the crime that they did. For many years, People, especially those serving term to life sentences for things like murder, kidnap, um, 15 years to life, 25 to life, 35 to life, they go in front of a, what is called the uh, Board of Parole hearings. And a group of commissioners makes a determination of whether or not they're suitable to re-enter society. Part of that process has become a for the board whether the individual has an understanding of the causative factors that brought them to the point they were willing to commit the crime that they did. And for many of the people within prison, they've never really even looked at that. And so we get a lot of men that, and women that come to our program hoping to find those answers so they can go in and give the, the right answer to the board. But in the process... So it's a, for some people, it's a strategy. Is, is that a fair thing to say? Is that a, or is that unkind? For some people, it is. They, they come in with that thought process. Yeah. The thing that is wonderful is that we have very well-trained volunteers that facilitate the program. And we really work on weeding out people that aren't willing to be accountable and do their own work. If you're not willing to do the work, we don't want you to be a part of the program. If you're there only because you're, you think you're going to use it as some kind of a game, we don't want you as part of the program. Yeah. We really get down into understanding each individual's crime. Uh, one of the first exercises that they do in the group is that they have to talk about their crime and be accountable are, for are, it. Um, are most of the people uh, involved in this, did they commit what, what, we, what I think of as a crime of passion? Or are there some of them that are more hardened, that are into drugs or what, what, you know, whatever? The, the people that are involved in our program run the gamut of primarily very violent crimes. Some of them can definitely be considered a crime of passion, but some of them have been execution type murders. Um, primarily the people that take our program are people that are serving life do, sentences. Do you, do you see a distinction between those and the, the likelihood that someone uh, committed a crime of passion, something that happened in the moment that that person maybe is, is, is more redemptive, can, can be redeemed better than the person who made a cold calculating uh, uh, decision to commit a, commit a crime for, for gain? I try not to put that kind of judgment on people. I, okay. I, myself and my team, we look at going in and meeting each individual where they're at. And I've seen people that were cold calculated multiple murderers 
that have completely turned their life around. And they're people that I'm comfortable enough that they can be around my family, my nieces, my nephews. And I wouldn't put anybody around my family that I thought would possibly do them any harm. Yeah. So you have the, the, the people, I was going to say the men, but of course, you know. We, we have saw, women too. Yeah, we have the women too. Uh, we just saw an example of that. It, um, uh, so they they choose to, to be, and if they're not choosing to, it, this is not going to work anyway. They need to choose to, to participate in this program. And then you have the victim, the families of the victims also must be hard for them. What brings them to this place? For many of them, they're, they're trying to find some kind of peace for themselves, an understanding of what happened. Um, you talked... In our, in our talk before, you talked about this thing that we think of as closure. And yeah, that's a term that I see used in the media and sometimes with different people where they want to talk about closure. And that's not something that one is ever going to have when it comes to a violent crime like homicide. There's nothing that is ever going to bring that person back. Um, there's nothing that, that's ever going to take that pain away, um, especially for the surviving family members of the victim. That pain will always be with them. The clip that we had showed Dion, who originally came as a surrogate speaker uh, for our victim offender education group. So uh, a surrogate speaker, so that the actual the actual victim, you try not to connect directly with the, or, or there's, I, there may be some, some, uh, le some legal reason that you can't connect yeah. the actual victim to the actual perpetrator. Right. Within our victim offender education group, we call it Vogue for short, we don't bring in the direct victims of our participants. Um, at the very end of the program, we do bring in who we call surrogate survivors people that have experienced similar crimes to the crimes that our participants have committed. And they come in and they share the impact that's had on them. The reason we don't bring in their direct victims is partially the rules and regulations of the California Department of Corrections. Um, but there is a process for what we call victim offender dialogues, VOD. And that process we work with um, within the California Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation is the Office of Victim and Survivor Rights and Services. They work directly with various survivors. And through that process, through that office, we can connect survivors that are willing to participate in a VOD with prisoners that are also willing to participate in a VOD. And there's a recent example of that was, as I shared earlier with you, um, the redemption project that Van Jones ran on CNN had a, six examples of people that went in and did VODs with the actual perpetrators of their with crime. With the actual, yeah, yeah, so we, we connect the, and that, that must be so difficult. I mean, how do you bring yourself, um, I, I mean, I'm trying to look at it from both sides. I can't, I can't, uh, it's hard for me to imagine uh, the, the emotion that, uh, that anyone would, anyone would go through to, to bring yourself to, to have, what, you know, what, uh, you know, you have to think of it as a confrontation. Um, and I know that's probably not the way you want to look at it, but it's, no. it, yeah. It, those aren't things that we go into lightly. It's not like we just bring them together at one meeting and say, okay, we're going to have a dialogue. When we're setting something up for a victim offender dialogue, we have a facilitator that will work with the responsible party, the person in prison, the person that did the harm, um, asking some of the questions that the survivors, the survivor, the survivor's family may want to ask. Um, that person will also be working with the survivors because we've got to prepare them. What are, how are you going to act if you don't get the answer that you want? What are the questions you're going to, that you're looking for? What are they looking for? Some of them are looking for understanding, particularly in crimes like homicide, wanting to know what were the last words of their loved ones, what was, what actually happened. Because many times 
when there's trials or particularly when there are plea bargains, a lot of that information never comes out. And even when you do have a trial, again, a lot of information may not actually come out because typically your prosecutors are looking at how do they get a conviction and your defense attorneys are looking at how do we either get the defendant absolved or get the lowest possible conviction that we can. And so when you have the legal teams looking at that competitive they really process, control the information, don't they? they're controlling the yeah. information and they're not necessarily looking for the truth. Yeah. They're looking at what they can get to the meet best. what yeah. their desire is. Yeah. And do the, do the victims uh, often get, they, they, they're not going to get closure, we kind of we kind of know that, right. but do they get some satisfaction normally or uh, some people kind of walk away thinking, oh, that wasn't worth, what, how, how do people react normally? Each time is different. I've never seen or participated in a circle where someone walked away and didn't feel that they didn't feel it wasn't worth their time and their energy. Almost everyone that I've met have come away with a better understanding of what has happened to them. And for instance, going back to our victim offender education group, there have been circles that I've been a part of where survivors have, have come in and have said ahead of time, I don't want any other participants, any other prisoners sitting next to me. I don't want them shaking my hand. I don't want them trying to talk to me. I'm just here to tell my story. And at the end of that day-long discussion, that sometimes five, six hours in length between the survivors and the prisoners, talking about the impact of the crime that they either suffered or that they committed. And at the end of that day, this one particular survivor that I'm thinking of actually went around the room and hugged the men. Oh my, yeah. Um, Dion, who was in the clip, as she stated, she was looking for the death penalty for the person that killed her husband right. and was happy that she was able to get that. But as time went on, she realized she wasn't getting that closure that people told her about. And so she finally came in as a survivor she speaker for us. She got the ultimate in what we call legal justice, didn't she? She yeah. got the ultimate in that, but that wasn't what she was looking it for. It didn't give her any peace. Yeah. And she eventually was brought to our group. She came in as a survivor speaker, and it really touched her heart. And she ended up becoming one of our facilitators and even became one of our board members huh. and was part of the board for many years and continues to to be involved in this type of work because she realized that irregardless of the harm someone has done, every human being is redeemable. And one of the things we look at is we don't want to try and make a decision of who we're going to throw away because we really do believe everyone is redeemable. How hard was it for you to get in? It seems like you embraced this. You, it, it, the way I yeah. just heard you a minute ago, you got, you were, you were released. From, did you, um, do you mind if I ask you how, how much, uh, what, what was your sentence? How long were you sentenced and how long did you serve? I was sentenced to 15 years to life mm -hmm. for second degree murder. And I served 23 and a half years, just under 23 and a half years. 15 to life and you served 23. Yeah. And, um, uh, so, why did it, why, I'm not sure how to ask this question, Leonard. What, uh, what were the conditions that got, you know, that got you out? What? <laughs> That's a really long story. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, we have about, you know, three or four seconds to go. <laughs> I mean, I was eventually released by the Superior Court of Solano County um, as a result of winning three different writs of habeas corpus, two against the Board of Parole hearings, and then one against Governor Schwarzenegger. Um, I don't know what that means. 
So within the legal system, there's an appeal process called writ of habeas corpus, and it's basically saying that you are being held illegally. Oh. And within the, within the laws of California, when you're serving a, a life sentence, particularly, they've changed the laws since I've come home. But while I was in, uh, California Penal Code said that the prisoner shall normally be found suitable for parole at their initial parole consideration hearing unless they were deemed a threat to society. And for many years, the parole board was saying based solely upon the original crime, people were still a threat to society. And in 2007, the California Supreme Court may, had two cases come down on the same day, in Ray Chaputis and in Ray Lawrence, that made a determination that the board could not continue to say that the original crime alone was the foundation for determining that someone was still a threat to society. Right. Okay. They needed to have current evidence that a person was a current threat. And so your, your behavior in prison uh, is really what, what causes that? Yeah. yeah, the Superior Court as well as the uh, California Court of Appeals had stated that what I did while I was in prison was what they wished every prisoner would do and that the board needed to find current evidence that I was a current threat to society if they were going to find me unsuitable for parole. And so when they took me back for a parole hearing, they didn't have any current evidence. So they found me suitable. And in California, the governor has a chance to review parole decisions. And when the, when the decision went in front of Governor Schwarzenegger, he decided to reverse the parole grant and so we filed a writ of habeas corpus against him and then the court yeah. five months later ordered my uh, release. And I, uh, yes, and, and that is that is a question, because I know a little bit about this this issues of a determinate sentence versus an indeterminate sentence and what that means and how that is impacted by, uh, by what the governor can do and what the governor can't do and it's a mess uh, from what, I, what I've seen. Uh, and maybe, maybe I'll get you back on another time and we can talk about all of that. Um, well, let's see. Um, tell me a little bit about your organization. How, how are you organized? You're a nonprofit? We're a nonprofit organization. We were founded in 1997 with one group of men in a circle process at San Quentin. And through the years, uh, different groups started coming into the program. They were looking for ways to create other opportunities for men at San Quentin to rehabilitate themselves. And there were programs such as a parenting program. Um, at one point there was a yoga program that has become its own nonprofit, the Prison Yoga Project, uh, a gardening project that's now the Insight Garden Program that's in many prisons across the country mm -hmm. now. Uh, Brothers Keepers, which started off as a suicide prevention program within the prison. Um, one of the men serving a life sentence had finally decided he'd had enough and hung himself. And a group of the men came together and said, how do we support one another? And created this organization, Brothers, Brothers Keepers. And are, these are all related in some way to IPP? Inside? They're all under the umbrella. They, uh -huh. at one time they were under the umbrella of IPP. Brothers Keepers inside is still a part. Project, IPP. Yeah. So, uh, you, you, and uh, was this already established when you got out of prison and you came onto it, or did you? Is this your, is this your baby? Is this something that you? you not okay. Wasn't my baby. I kind of got that feeling that, that, but it's but it's not true. You no. this is something that was already in, in play, and you participated in it. I assume. Yes. And uh, and then that uh, that challenged you to you know step up to take a higher uh, higher role. Yeah. In two thousand four, I was involved in a a program that we call violence prevention and it was based specifically on addressing domestic violence. And then in 2005 I had started another program, an interfaith restorative justice program, and while I was in the process of putting that together I would found out that the Insight Prison Project had started the Victim Offender Education Group and I was able to get into the second cohort of that group in 2005. And that really opened up my eyes. Um, 
we really get into, one, talking about the crime. For many people in prison, they never talk about the crime. And within our group, as I shared earlier, that's one of the first things that we do. People have to come in, they have to be accountable for their crime, and the different people in the circle with them will give them feedback on what they've heard. And it allows people to start developing insight. And then we get into other things like a timeline into the past. What brought them to the point they were willing to commit whatever crime it was they committed? Because nobody comes out of the womb violent. It's something we're socialized into. Yeah. Yeah. We get into understanding what the difference between guilt and shame is. Um, with the pain that we've caused people, there's a reason for us to feel guilty. And there's a reason to feel shame. But at some point, one needs to be able to let go of that shame I, I, I'm if they want to start moving forward. Yeah, thank you. Th I, I'm finding myself just wanting to ask this question, and I'm not sure why I want to ask this question, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Uh, it's, it seems like this is a really impertinent question, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Okay. Okay. So you served 23 years. Do you feel like you served enough time? As far as for punishment? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, is there anything that I can ever do to bring my victim back? No. Yeah. Is there... And that's the thing we were talking about. The right. prison. The prison is one prison. The, the yeah. physical place is another. The other. The other prison. You're. You're, you're never going to be released from that. Right. I but still wake you're up. You get some relief. Right. Yeah. Okay. I live every day with the guilt of having taken another person's life. Yeah. And in my situation, the life of someone that I loved. Yeah. Yeah. This is tough. Um, anything else you want to say? There's, for me, this is something that I'm very passionate about. The work that is being done in our programs is truly changing people's lives. Not only the, the people in prison, but the survivors as well. One of the things that really touched my heart back in 2007, we had two mothers whose children had been murdered came into San Quentin. And one of the things they talked about, and there was a piece in the clip that talked about hurt people hurt people. But one of the things that those two mothers talked about was a flip side of that. And that flip side is that healed people heal people. So while many of us have committed really egregious harm, taking another human's life, the healing work that we've done on ourselves and that we work with other men or women inside to help them also find that healing for themselves and that understanding then also has a ripple effect. And many of our graduates are working in different nonprofit organizations here in the community, helping with reentry, helping with victims and survivor services, um, and being really productive human beings. And it really does come down to who would you want living next to you? Somebody who's just been in a cage and not done any work on themselves to fight, figure out who they are and what brought them to that point? Or someone that has really delved deep into everything, into the worst moment of their life and looked back and reflected on the different things that brought them to that worst moment so that they now understand it and they're able to speak about it, they're able to share it, and in many cases, they're able to work with others in the hopes that they don't have to live the type of experiences that we have, and hopefully turn them around from possibly committing the harms that we've committed. And with that, the, we couldn't do this work without our volunteers both the survivors that come in and speak, as well as the volunteers that come and facilitate the programs. So we're always looking for new facilitators, new volunteers. And I'm not gonna say it's easy work because you are dealing with individuals worst moment of their lives. And some of the crimes that we hear about are very heinous. Some of the people we work with are serving life without the possibility of parole. Um, and some of those very same individuals, because of the work they've done, governors have found them 
redeemable enough to grant them commutations. And then the parole board has also found them redeemable enough to release them. And they're now home and continuing to do this work as well. And so we're always, this always looking for volunteers. Largely due to the process that, you're, yeah. that you're, you've created. And, uh, uh, give me an idea. Uh, uh, who initiates the 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 uh, the connection? Is it the is it usually the uh, uh, the prisoner who 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 needs that connection, or is it usually the family of the victim uh, that that wants that connection, or does it go? You, do you do you seek out do you seek out, seek out to make the connection, or do they contact you? How do, how do, how would a typical uh, process start? With our Vogue programs, it's the prisoners making a choice of their own to come in and wanting to be a part of that program. Many times people will go in front of the parole board and the parole board may tell them, come take our program. Uh -huh. um, then the other thing that you're talking about with matching victims with their direct yeah. uh, offenders, responsible parties, that's something that sometimes the prisoners are able to contact the Office of Victim and Survivor Rights and Services and send what we call an accountability letter expressing that if the victim's family ever wants to have some kind of dialogue that they'd be willing to do that. Uh -huh. Then if the victim's family contacts the Office of Victim and Survivor Rights and Services and says they're interested in that, the victim of survivor rights and services would look through their database. Which direction does it usually start? Does it start from the prisoner side or from the victim side? It varies dramatically. Okay. So, yeah, there's no, there's um, no we one. have no control over that. <laughs> the, uh, and so I, I imagine that sometimes the victims will contact the, the I forget what's the name of the organization. The, the Office of Victim and Survivor Office, Rights and Office Services. Office of Victim and Survivor Rights. Okay. Yeah. So, um, so they or, they, contact or they'll contact the district attorney. Uh, and then the district attorney may contact that office. Uh, interesting. Yeah. 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 Do you think most of the victims uh, know that this is a service that's available? Unfortunately, I've found a lot of victims do not know that that's available. Yeah. And so that's part of your outreach, isn't it? To let them know? Yeah. Yeah. We want to let people know not only about that process, but also about coming in and serving as surrogate victims for uh, our victim offender education group. Yeah. Um, I know of two women that have done the victim offender dialogues with the perpetrator of their crime that killed their loved ones. Um, those dialogues didn't go well. Uh, but when those two women also came in as surrogate survivors and sat in on our victim offender education group, that's where they found healing that they needed. Uh, okay. And so you may not always find that healing within a dialogue. We never know what's going to happen. Um, a lot of people want to talk about going into a dialogue like that of looking for forgiveness or looking for an apology. We never go in with that kind of thing in mind. We do not put ourselves in a position to try and tell a survivor what they need to do. They need to do what they need to do for them. Yeah. Yeah. It's not our place to try and tell somebody that they need to forgive. Um, and coming out and just trying to apologize to somebody, that apology may come off as fake. Yeah. Yeah, so a lot, that's why we talk about being accountable. We use a lot of acronyms in the work that we do, and one of them is, what do we need to be able to live? We need air. We've got to be able to breathe. And we use that acronym AIR, accountable for our past, integrity in the moment, and responsible for our future. Excellent. And we, that's how we really try to teach our, the men and women so in our programs. You, you have certainly taken that on, Leonard. Uh, Thank you. When, you. when you were released from prison, you decided that this is where you wanted to go. Was that, a, was that like a career move for you or just something that was interesting? Because and, and, now you've, you have a pretty, a pretty high, uh, what's, what's, what's the staff there at, at IPP? We have five people on staff. Okay. 
Uh, so we are actually a small organization. But you have presence but we around have, the country, don't you? We have 80, over 80 volunteers yeah. that are taking the program into 12 prisons here in California. Where do you get your funding? A lot of the times it's through personal donations, through foundation grants, and then the last four or five years that helped us expand, there were some grants from the California Department of Corrections for replication. So you got into this as a volunteer because it was something that really interested you, or did you start off with it as a, did, did they hire you? How did that work? Well, that... Because you're ex executive director now, right? I'm executive so. director now. I never expected to be in this role. Okay. Um, when I came home in 2010, I had the opportunity to go back to school, and I earned a bachelor's degree in business at the University of San Francisco. Oh, very good. And while I was there, one of the things that the University of San Francisco requires of students are service learning projects. And so when I would have different service learning projects for classes, I was looking for ways to be able to give back to the Insight Prison Project. So I would do projects for, projects in school for the Insight Prison Project. And about a year after I came home, the uh, board of directors asked me to join the board as a board member to help give them insight into the, the organization. We had a, really, a lot of wealthy people on the board at that time, but they didn't have a, a history with understanding the criminal justice system. So they wanted a view from somebody that had been inside. And so I, I brought that to them. Um, served on the board for seven and a half years. And, and towards the end of 2017, our executive director at that time, Billy Mizell, decided she wanted to focus more on ending the death penalty. So she stepped away and the board and her had asked me to take over. Um, it was a difficult decision because I had landed a really good job at the East Bay Municipal Water District as oh. uh, a maintenance machinist. Oh. And it was hard leaving a union position and yeah. security. And the benefits and all, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, but as I shared earlier, the the changes I've seen in people through these programs, I wanted to do everything I could to make sure well, we this, kept these programs it, it, going it, inside. It, uh, uh, so obviously your passion. Uh, yes. Yeah, so, there, there, so there you are per yeah. pursuing your passion and you, you, seem like, uh, you seem like a happy man. At least you, 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 there's some fulfillment that I'm seeing here. In a, um, yeah, you, I, it's difficult being the boss. <laughs> um, it's got the weight of the world on my shoulders yeah. at, a lot of the time and not many days off. But again, the, seeing the changes that people are making, seeing the connections that when guys come home and they're wanting to come and work for the organization, they're wanting to come out and work with different groups and communities to try and make our community safer. Um, the connections that they make with their families that they've been separated from. Yeah. One of our graduates, just a few months ago came home after 48 years of incarceration. And so wanting to be there to help him through that transition period, uh, wanting to be able to see him continue to grow and continue to be able to give back. Um, those are things that are priceless. I mean, again, we can never we can never do anything to take away the harm that we've done. And we can try and bring as much resolve with us to try and help the communities that we've harmed well, as we possibly can. You are definitely making a difference. And uh, I, Thank you. I can't tell you how, uh, um, it's just amazing to see uh, your, your dedication to this and your passion for it. And uh, you are making a difference in our community. Thank um, you. And um, I, ho I hope you're feeling enough gratitude because you deserve <laughs> a whole lot of it. Leonard, thank you so much. Thank you. I really, really thank appreciate you. you coming down and talking to us. And you're going you're gonna, to uh, speak to our Rotary. You spoke, you spoke to my Rotary Club, the Rotary Club of Nevada yes. Sunrise. You, you spoke to us, I think, about two years ago. Yeah. 
And so now we have some updates. You're going to come back, I think, next week. Yes. And uh, you're going to uh, speak to us again. Do you like a live audience better than just sitting here in front of cameras? I do prefer a live <laughs> audience. Um, yeah. Well, you're, I mean, you're, sometimes that's tougher because you can see the judgments on people's faces. Uh, yeah. um, but that comes with this work. I have a feeling that dissolves after a while, though. I mean, uh, mm -hmm. dur during the course of your talks, some people, because you are so- Sometimes it does, sometimes so, it doesn't. You're so forthright in your presentation. Thank um, you. Yeah, so that helps a lot. Anyway, thank you so much. And I'm, um, I appreciate you tuning in. And um, we will have other guests in the future. I'm not sure we can top this one, but um, uh, I'm not sure we want to top this one. So anyway, thank you for, thank you for joining us, and um, we'll see you again on Ask John. Take care now.